Hello everyone, hope you're all having a good day so far. I'm just going to get started since we're slightly running behind and I have no idea how much of this I'm going to get through because I originally designed this for an hour long so we're going to kind of just speed run this. As much as the title sounds like shit, I got Azure AI to write this because I hate naming things. If you've ever seen a CTF challenge I've written, it's normally like, I'm too drunk to name this or I'll name this later. Uh, but essentially all this is, is just dumb shit in history. Uh, it's not technical, it's not even to do anything with cybersecurity, realistically, it's just dumb shit in history. But the obligatory who am I, uh, one of the senior onboarding engineers at Quorum Cyber, ex NUSEC committee for the last few years, uh, previous neighbor student, both undergrad and uh, masters, and then just a, recovery, a recovering coffee addict. Uh, and I'm pretty much bored cyber on most platforms if you're interested in anything I say. Uh, Lessons for today are pirates, because why not? The bizarre Cold War strategies, looking at specifically two categories. Uh, don't be like the Russians, and then some rapid fire lessons, just of dumb shit in history. But looking at pirates, and I kind of just picked pirates because I'm pretty sure I was reading about Black Flag, the Assassin's Creed game. But when you think about pirates, you think of the likes of Blackbeard and any other favorite pirates, famous pirates, as well as walking the plank, even though realistically that was not the most common practice. Pirates, because stereotypes and then plundering because again stereotypes but when I mentioned uh, Assassin's Creed Black Fad it reminded me of Major Steed Bonnet I don't actually play that game I see at least two hands um, so he is actually a character in the game but he's also a real life person where essentially he was an aristocrat quite popular in society a womanizer and also Fairly fucking rich. He had an acre, 400 acres of sugarcane fields as well as slave owner, but that's a separate issue. Um, and was very much a people person. However, he had a change of heart, probably to do with the writing and authorship at the time around piracy, making it sound like a really kind of wannabe doing career, and left his family and four kids uh, and went for life of piracy. Now, he bought, he bought a ship. Normally, pirates would steal a ship, but he thought that'd be too much poor people work. So he bought a ship, bought cannons, paid it for a crew, unlike, you know, stealing crew from other ships, uh, and now they had most of his to-do list sorted, he didn't actually know how to sail a boat. So, moving on, he had his ship, the Revenge, where he, you know, didn't have his usual palette of foods, of, you know, of, I don't know, of caviar and other rich people foods, um, and survived off kind of salt meat slabs and anything else they'd catch. Um, on top of that, it started off well, they had some good fights, they caught um, a few ships out, managed to plunder them well, let them go, except the Barbadian ships where he was originally from, which he would rob and then just burn so word would not get back to his family that he was out pirating. Uh, so he had some questionable experiences to which his crew was beginning to lose faith. And that's when they spotted uh, what they thought was a Spanish merchant ship. And they were beginning to sneak up on the ship and set a sail after it. And they soon found out it was not a merchant ship, but a Spanish man of war. So instead of having a ship full of shiny metal, it had a ship full of deadly metal. And as the ship decided to completely rewrite the elements of the air surrounding the ship, they managed to escape and fled to the pirate outpost of uh, Nassau. Moving on from there, he actually then met quite a few pirates and actually befriended Edward Teach, who is also known as Blackbeard. Blackbeard. Beard. Um, and ganged up with Backbeard to essentially, um, he was made a spare part in his own ship. He was no longer the captain, but instead he was essentially the kind of token mascot almost of his own ship, where Blackbeard would give off the instructions and would, he would, would just sit in the captain's study and read books. Um, Shortly after that, Blackbeard got his own new flagship and left Bonnet and took most of his good crew and stuff, so he was left on his own and he regained his captaincy. Um, however, shortly after that, they again were crew was losing respect in him and they went after a, another merchant ship, the Protestant. And they thought, you know what, we might actually be able to beat this one. Uh, unfortunately, this was a 400 ton, 26 cannon merchantman. Uh, which they lost quite badly. Barely escaped with his life, lost 36 crew, if I remember correctly, and again, lost quite a lot of respect in his command. Um, and as I said, they bumped back into Blackbeard at another outpost, and they then teamed up, and then Blackbeard stole the ship and everything, so Bonnet then bought a new ship, went after Blackbeard, but never actually saw him again. He had a vendetta against him. However, the British then were getting fed up of all the pir piracy in the area, so then put out royal pardons for everyone in the area, saying, look, we'll forgive you if you just don't do it again. Uh, however, they went, got their pardons, 
and he immediately went back to piracy after Blackbeard betrayed him. So shortly after that, um, I'll jump back just now. Shortly after that, again, jumping ahead quite a bit, never bumped into Blackbeard again. However, he became a lot more violent, a lot more kind of aggressive towards everything with the vengeance for Blackbeard. Um, but he changed his ways, so he technically was not being a pirate, but a businessman, as uh, you know, you might see this in Donald Trump's Art of the Deal, where he would take everything that was on this other person's ship and then gave them a bit of rope or a single coin or a button or something, because then it was considered a trade. Not a very fair trade, but a trade nonetheless. But he was then recaptured and taken to Charleston, where he escaped, however, was then recaptured after four days off on the run and was executed subsequently in 1718. Um, I'll do a summary of all the lessons you can get from all these topics right at the end because I'm just going to power through the topics. So bizarre Cold War strategies. Now, when you think of the Cold War, you've got Russia and America primarily. However, you've also got East and West Berlin, but that's a, you could do an entirely other presentation on the kind of nuclear sandwich that uh, Germany was between the US and Russia at the time. However, in 19... Um, I think it was in the 1980s, if I remember right, Matthias Roy thought he'd be able to save the world. He wrote a 20-page manifesto designed for um, Grubacek, the Grubachev, I don't know, Russian leader at the time, um, which essentially was how to lead to world peace and de-escalate everything, get rid of the arms race. Um, and he was, in, he was a... a I'm not going to call him an answer pirate. He had 50 hours flight experience. Um, so he took his wee crop duster, flew around the world to eventually make his way to Russia. However, in approaching Russia, the surface air missiles were told to stand down. The fighter jets were then told they cannot engage with him. And uh, it was the first, essentially the first uh, German invasion to actually make it to Moscow because he would then land in the Red Square. Um, one slight hiccup with his plan. He didn't know Russian. So he suddenly got arrested for you know, poor flight violations. Uh, I think it was malicious hooliganism, hooliganism or whatever the word is as well. Um, but the fact that the Russians failed to stop this guy landing in Red Square led for Gorbachev to be able to push quite a lot of reforms within the military, completely gut it of all the corruptness and, well, most of it, and um, make all the changes he wanted to make. Now, the main focus that I was talking about when looking at the Cold War specifically would be uh, intelligence and culture, where you've kind of got the spies, where you think you've got the, <laughs> the relatively stereotypical 50s or 60s British or American spies, where they've got the goofy spy gadgets. However, one of the projects worked on by the CIA in the Cold War was Acoustic Kitty. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this. It is quite a dumb project. In short, they installed an antenna, a microphone into a cat under the skin. If you thought a microphone on a cat would look obvious over the skin, yes, you're right, it would. But the idea was that they'd train and disguise this cat to be a bug and train it to sit and listen to any commie gossip outside the, US the USSR embassy in the United States, DC. However, there are several flaws in this plan. One, they managed to train the cat based on noise while inside. However, when they took the cat outside for training, whenever it got hungry or bored, it would just wander off. So they then did another surgery and essentially overrode its ability to be hungry. I'm not sure how they did that. I didn't question it. Um, further to that, they then had some successful testing. But on their first mission, what actually happened was they went into a an unmarked van to the Russian embassy in DC, released the cat within the first few minutes, it was actually run over by a taxi. Um, wasn't a very successful mission. It sank $20 million, took five years of research, and just flopped. Uh, now, the official line of the FBI at this time, or the CIA, whoever it was, um, doing this publicly was that the cat was retired and lived a long and happy life after having all the technology removed from him because the reality if the cat dying probably was less tasteful. However, you've also then got the USSR with the Bulgarian umbrella. Now there was a there was a publicist that escaped to the US, uh, no sorry, the UK um, from Bulgaria who was essentially just taking the piss out of the Bulgarian president at the time over the BBC radio and in the media and newspapers and the president was a big fan of this. So he worked with the KGB at the time to take out the um, 
the, the publicist, and that happened actually in London. Um, what happened was the design of this is that it would fire a small kind of rice-sized pellet out the tip of umbrella, uh, which was filled with rice and poison, if I remember correctly. And it only, I think, ever had one actual use case, but culturally has appeared in numerous TV shows, including like an episode of NCIS and other stuff. So arguably, it's kind of kind of a more successful mission, but this time, but quite a bizarre solution to it, unlike the United States, which had a really bizarre way of doing things, but just flopped. Um, the other way, uh, topic I was going to cover was culture. Now, specifically, there was the Cola Pepsi Wars at the time um, as well in the United States. However, cola was also a massive popular drink with uh, an ex-Russian military leader whose name I can't remember and or pronounce, um, Georgi Zukov, Gregory Zukov, Zukov something. Anyway, uh, he couldn't be seen drinking actual Coke because Coke was banned in Russia um, as a massive thing. It's the US, it's, co it's capitalist, it's, you can't be seen drinking it. So he was actually introduced to it by Truman early, in earlier years. So he got back in touch with President Truman at the time and said, hey, look, I, I want Coke. Um, and uh, there's a joke I want to make that is absolutely tasteless, so I'm not going to say that. But anyway, um, he, he then had Truman approach Coca-Cola and essentially create white Coke or clear Coke, which was essentially a way that Zhukov could drink Coke in Russia while it was appearing that he was just an ex-military hero who defeated the Nazis and was now a raging alcoholic drinking pure vodka. Um, <laughs> It works. It's, it's about who you know, ultimately. But then on the other hand of the Pepsi-Cola wars, you have Pepsi. Now, Pepsi um, was dealing quite a lot in the USSR. They were allowed to trade in the USSR. However, the value of Pepsi very quickly outweighed the value of vodka because the way that their trades worked was Pepsi would give Pepsi, Pe uh, Russia Pepsi, and Russia would give Pepsi vodka. But that trade soon became unmanageable because of the value of vodka plummeting. So what they did was uh, they, gave them, they gave them military ships. Specifically, 17 submarines, one cruiser, one frigate, and one destroyer. There are theories that it was the sixth largest mil uh, naval fleet in the world for some point, but that is, as I said, theories. There's disputes online about that. But specifically, under the guise of he had a fleet. Um, <laughs> It then got to the point where essentially the Soviets could no longer give them military ships and essentially started building oil tankers for Pepsi. Um, and I think, I, I don't know if that ever stopped. Um, but that's, that's kind of dumb shit that occurred in the Cold War. I could do another whole talk on the Cold War, uh, but that is a different day. Now, don't be like the Russians. This was a talk that I originally gave as an accept of this one that I fleshed out now at Hack Thursday a couple of months ago. I don't know if anyone's there to see it, but it, people thought it was funny. But when you think of Russians, you think of, well, vodka, Putin, fair elections, their naval abilities, as very recently disclaimed in, uh, in Ukraine, and Sputnik for Donan, who's not here today because he's in B sides Dublin, and blatantly just communism. But looking at a timeline of all this, you've got Putin becoming president back in 99, the Chernobyl disaster in 86, Sputnik in 57, the forming of the Soviet Union in 22. But the period I'm going to talk about today is specifically between 1904 and 1905, which, for anyone that knows a little bit of history, was the Russo-Japanese War. Now, this was, um, <laughs> this was kind of the time for expansion. Russia was looking for a warm water area to have their fleet for not only military purposes, but maritime commerce. Um, so they, quote unquote, leased a port from China, which, um, which, which didn't go down too well with the Japanese. And they attacked Port Arthur, essentially. And um, fast forward a few battles, the Russians are losing really badly. So the Tsar authorizes the Baltic fleet to reinforce the fleet in the east. Now, for anyone that doesn't know geography too well, um, the Baltic Sea is there, up by, you know, Finland. Um, boats don't like ice as well, so you couldn't really go this way around the world um, because of the Arctic. And you've got, what, that long a journey to go instead? Um, now, annoyingly, I don't have a clicker to point at shit, so. I'm just going to point at the screen. You can act like I'm pointing at something. Um, but going this way around the world, it was really annoying for the Russians because they didn't have any military bases and or ports in the kind of North Africa or the southern side of Europe or the Middle East. So it would have been an 
ecological nightmare to organize as well as just logistical nightmare. Um, but it gets better because the crew sitting in a frozen port all the time would not be going out on the water too often, so they were completely untrained. They were literally peasants just living in poor Russia at the time. And the journey started off quite well, as you'd expect, with in the first two minutes of leaving the port, one ship drops their anchor into the ocean and had to re-get it, and then the other one crashed into the uh, flagship and had to be taken back to port for repairs. And then getting better, they got round to Finland um, and Denmark, and they were slowly, slowly going well, except um, two boats approached the fleet, and there might have been some fear and paranoia in the crew, and what they did was they start opening fire, thinking they were Japanese torpedo boats. By Denmark. I'm not going to let anyone else figure out, you know, the mistake in that. But essentially, what it was, was after about seven minutes of firing, realizing their mistake, it was a message for the admiral who had been promoted uh, in charge of the fleet. And, yeah, nerves were high. Paranoia was high. What could go wrong? Um, you've then got the fact that... <laughs> You've then got the fact that they've then made it past the Baltic uh, Ocean, Baltic Sea, and made it to Donner Bank. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the Donner Bank incident. However, that is just as successful as you'd expect it to be, where after 20 minutes um, of sailing and noticed some fishing boats, um, they again thought it was Japanese torpedo boats, thinking you, you might have learned a lesson for the first time. No. Um, it was about six British trawlers that they started opening fire on. Now, they lost two crew in a boat. However, the Russians also managed to kill one of their own sailors and an Orthodox priest. So they tied with the Russian fleet, technically. Um, and yeah, after all this, they had an international incident of sorts. Could, Britain could have started a war with Russia over this, but they didn't. Instead, they just denied them access to the Suez Canal, which meant that they couldn't go around the relatively longer way they were already planning, but instead had to go all the way around Africa to make it to the, um, the fleet they needed to reinforce. Um, now, Africa is pretty big, and they were a slow-moving coal-powered fleet, which essentially kind of coasted down the um, coasted down the side of Africa very slowly, uh, cutting telegraph cables and firing at more civilian ships along the way, mistaking them for more um, torpedo boats. I forgot the word there. Um, and essentially, they kind of also resupplied re themselves and reinforced themselves at one of the final ports in Europe, which was owned by Germany at the time. Lovely people. Couldn't go wrong there at this time of year. But essentially... Because they had such a long journey ahead of them now, they took double loads of everything on, including double loads of coal, and they kept that openly on the deck, which again resulted in several sailors just dying of black lung. Uh, with morale being so low, they stopped by Madagascar to then essentially let the sailors get pets, including uh, an alligator, several chameleons that they would consistently lose around the ship, and a snake that then developed a fondness for vodka. Um, it also then bit several crewmen and was venomous, and they also died. Um, but yeah, so at one point, the sailors were holding a funeral for one of the male sailors who had died along this journey. And during the ceremony, they were doing the gun salute off the, off the coast, and they didn't realize friendly fire was on and hit one of their own ships in the process. And it just kept getting better from there. Um, and as they realized they were approaching Japan, the admiral kind of very quickly realized, ah, shit, I should train them. Uh, and very quickly put together a very easy target practice where one ship was towing another ship and they were trying to fire at it. They successfully hit the ship that was towing the target ship. Uh, again, damaging their own fleet in, in, the, uh, in the process. It was the single hit they had had. They didn't hit anything else. But at last, their fleet was approaching Japan. Dead or night, they extinguished her lights except the hospital ship as per maritime code, where the hospital ship had to remain lit. And the hospital ship came across some boats, and they thought they were the Russian fleet that were here to reinforce, so said, hey guys, shush, we're sneaking up on the, Rush, uh, on the Japs, we're going to surprise them. Yeah, no, it was a Japanese boat that they'd actually um, just, uh, just alarmed on, and essentially told them that they were there, and then the Battle of Tsushima uh, ensues, and the Russian fleet was decimated. This did essentially end the war, in fairness, but... Uh, as you can imagine, the Russians just very, oh, I've got more pictures. The Russians very just blatantly lost. It was an absolute massacre after so many of them 
died at their own hand, essentially, on the journey. And finally, I was just going to do some rapid-fire dumb shit in history, because I've, there was too many things I could have put in this talk, but starting with um, the Jack Daniels. Yes, Jack Daniels is in the whiskey. He stubbed his toe once at some point. I couldn't find the year associated with this, but he stubbed his toe, kicking a safe that he'd forgot the combination of with all his money. However, the, kicking his toe caused it to get, um, well, infected, and subsequently died of this. Um, moving on, you've then got the Soviet anti-tank dogs back in World War II, which essentially were trained to run under, or they were trained to run under tanks. The idea of them running under alley tanks and blowing themselves up to then destroy the tanks. However, because they were trained based on Russian tanks, they kept running under the Russian tanks during the war and blowing up their own tanks. You then got the Germans pretending to be British during World War I, which was the German ship SMS Cap Tarfalga was essentially redesigned and painted to be the RMS Kamenia, and the idea of it being that the ship would sneak up on British ships looking like one of theirs and then open fire and attack. However, on its first voyage in this design configuration, the first British ship it ever came across was the actual RMS Kamenia. And again, subsequently, the Germans lost and the ship was sunk. Um, then during uh, Andrew Jackson's funeral, um, he had a parrot, and his parrot had to be kicked out of his own funeral because he was swearing too much. Uh, and then another final one was Frederick the Great uh, of Prussia and his potatoes. He essentially had, um, during the famine, uh, he was giving a, a free potato. He had free potato policies to make sure the people remained fed. However, many people just rejected of it. So to make potatoes seem more appealing, uh, around the potato fields he posted guards so that they would look more, you know, appealing, make them look like they're valuable in some sense, and it worked. Um, but again, running through it because I've only got a couple of minutes less, basic lessons learned out of this, out of all three genuinely major topics I've talked about and then the rapid ones, is train your staff, train them to actually identify threats, make sure they know what malicious looks like and what you know normal activity looks like, make sure they can identify the different types of threats as well so they don't mistake it for one thing and give the wrong remediation. Then you've got making sure that you've got the right amount of resources for any project. You're not over-resourcing a project that doesn't need it, and you're not under-resourcing any project that you are having problems with. Then you've also got the fact that you can have ineffective communication where you don't know who needs to talk to who, you don't know who needs to do what, you don't know which aspect of a project belongs to who, and it's just a shit show to try and you know sort out and sus. But then you've also got working with accurate intelligence and the facts. Don't base anything on assumptions, don't jump the gun, just wait and listen to any decision that needs to be made and uh, listen to the people that know what they're talking about. And if that's you that knows what you're talking about, then good luck. Um, but then also be flexible with strategy, be able to change what you need to do based on the situation you're dealing in. Uh, effective leadership, again, I'm going to tie in the next one as well, which is the same, maintain good morale, which is essentially, like, <sighs> pizza parties are great, sure, everyone loves it, but, like, everyone just goes to work to get paid, ultimately, so pay the staff what they deserve. Even if that is you know, a wee bonus once in a while, even if that is just essentially praise in some sense, training in other senses, but, yeah, good morale, effective leadership, knowing what you're doing yourself, essentially, make sure you know what you're doing. If you have gotten a job and you're essentially lied on your CV or bullshit your way into your job, you're going to essentially find yourself absolutely lost, dumbfounded upon anything, and you will eventually get caught out, no doubt. But at the same time, it's just, it's kind of common sense. And then, don't do anything out of frustration. Don't be like the parrot. Don't blatantly swear to customers unless, you know, you've got that rapport with them. But at the same time, like, know your audience, essentially. Know who you're talking to so that you don't say the wrong thing. I had a phone call from a dad earlier today where essentially he pissed off the director of a company because he was telling customers um, the truth, essentially. And that made the director's job difficult. So my dad was like, fuck you, I quit. Uh, but yeah, like, don't do anything out of frustration. But at the same time, like, have effective communication. Tell the truth. Uh, I know it's very non-cyber related, but any questions? <laughs> Swear to fuck Scott, if that's you. <laughs> but if that's no questions, then fantastic. I hope you just, oh, hello. So actually, the snake wasn't in your vodka. Yeah. It also would wrap itself around the artillery guns, which would cause people to panic. Anything else? It's not you this time. Okay, I believe it. 
There'll be some, I bet. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm glad you all came. Hope you enjoyed, and hope you enjoy the rest of the day.